recording's going. Uh, so thanks everybody for uh, tuning in today. Uh, I believe we've had this topic before, but it's been a couple of years since we, we went over it. So I asked AJ Ragusa from Indiana University Global Mock to come in and give us an update on uh, the latest and greatest with what's going on with OESS and SDN and uh, what's going to be on tap for probably the next generation of this uh, going forward. So AJ, I will turn it over to you. So hi, everybody. I'm AJ Ragusa. Uh, I'm a manager here at uh, the Global Mac for the network automation and performance team. And um, OESS uh, has been kind of one of my projects for pretty much a, a decade at this point. Um, so I, I'm going to go through, this is more of a story about some of the history, some of the ups and downs of, um, of OESS, uh, some of where we're at and some of where we're going. So uh, I got, I've got a, a lot of content. Um, I'll move quickly through a few of the, um, the more fun, I, I find it fun, but, uh, but also interesting. So. Um, so just a really quick look at where we are today. So this is for Internet 2 AL2S. Um, just a quick look at the, the stats here. We've had got um, we've had 43,000 uh, layer two circuits created, 283 L3 VPNs, 856 active users, 218 different work groups, um, over 50 OESS releases, and uh, 377 NSI circuits provisioned. So. I, I, get, I hear a lot of times that we lack NSI support, but really we do have it. So um, OESS, the beginnings, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know how many people here know about this, but I'm, I'm gonna go into some of the history. Um, so really this started in 2011 as the NDDI um, project, which was Network Development and Deployment Initiative, which was part of OS3E Open Science Scholarship and Services Exchange. I didn't get to name anything, so I don't know where these names really came from. Ultimately, this is a partnership between Internet2, Indiana University, and Stanford University. And this created the NDDI network, um, which was five NEC switches deployed across the United States as a separate Internet2 network. Um, and it was all running OpenFlow and uh, using the OESS controller. Uh, keep in mind when we're doing this that OpenFlow is really new and the hardware and, and software behind this is all really experimental. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of learning and a lot of experimentation to figure this stuff out. Um, the fa our, our favorite is, um, you know, Dan and I were working on this and we would Google for something and the other one of us had posted the question on a form and nobody had ever responded. So we were, we were kind of stuck in that area. Um, so just a quick idea of what the architecture of OESS looked like when we were uh, initially doing this. The, the green circles represent the web services. Um, so these web services would interact with say the OESS database, um, create object models. And then we used a Dbus channel to essentially send messages um, across two different processes. So we had FWD CTL, which stands for forwarding controller. And so the provisioning uh, CGI would send would, would basically create the database model and then send a message to dbus that said hey go make this live on the network fwd ctl would then take that model convert it into flow mod messages for each of the switches and send a message to dbus which would send it to the nox openflow controller and then the nox openflow controller would actually send those messages out over the wire to the individual switches on the network so just really question, really quick how it worked. We've got, you know, the OpenFlow controller um, and it had um, this Python binding to it. So we actually ended up writing a Python um, script that listened for Dbus messages and would also submit Dbus messages. And that's how we did all of our inter-process communication from the Nox controller to all the other components of um, OESS. There were a bunch of individual processes that were long living for OESS. All of these were written in Perl. So we had FWD CTL, which, did, which was the forwarding controller. It would take the database and turn it into OpenFlow flow mods that we could then send out to the devices. Um, it would also handle things like failover, provisioning events, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. There was discovery, which basically did discovery of links and interfaces. Um, so if you remember, OpenFlow had packet in, packet out. And so you could actually send a packet out, 
get it on the other side and determine that there was a link between these two um, nodes. And so that we actually used that to discover the topology of the network and update the topology as it changed. VLAN stats was um, a process that we used to collect open flow statistics and turn it into RRD um, files that we could then display in the web UI to give you live traffic stats on your individual circuits. And then the notification daemon, which was just, it just sent out emails when things changed on the network. Um, and then obviously we had these web services that talked to the database and then used Dbus to send messages to the other OESS components. So the initial development really started off with three or four um, developers, designers, late, late 2010. Um, and this was all done with experimental NEC IBM switches with like alpha firmware. I mean, these things were so alpha. They were, when they shipped them to us, I believe they were IBM branded. And later on, NEC sent us little, um, like a new badge to stick on the device um, because they were really NEC switches. So it was uh, it was very interesting. Um, Miniet, I mean, it kind of existed. OVS kind of existed, but it was not really in a place where we could use it for a lot of our development. It was very basic. Um, and, you know, the development really took like 10 to 12 weeks. And every week we had a demo for Internet 2 to show progress as we were doing that development. It was It was pretty intensive. There were lots of very late night Thursdays where we were, you know, finishing things up and running through the demo. And then we'd meet early in the morning on a Friday at like 7 a.m., <laughs> run through our demo, come up with a list of things we had to fix before our 10 a.m. demo for Internet 2. It was it was a very, uh, it was rough, but, um, you know, we, we managed to do it. And eventually this was what we deployed for the NDDI network. Um, we also wrote a few extra little applications. We had Pingy, which, uh, did what it sounds like. It sent pings, uh, received those pings, and we would measure the latency and um, if the packets were making it through. And then we also had the virtual backhoe, which went out and uh, it, it was basically just allowed us to do up down of interfaces on the NDDI network via web UI. So that way then we could demo at say joint text, which we did several times. We demoed the capability of OESS to handle, for example, network outage events and other provisioning events. Um, so it was, it, was, it was kind of our fun way of doing those demos. That leads us to AL2S in 2012, which was when we really started the AL2S network. Um, initially deployed, deployed as Brocade MLXE 16s. It was, um, again, OpenFlow controlled. Um, later on, we added Juniper MX960s, still OpenFlow 1.0. Um, and one of the things not a lot of people actually realize is that um, most of the, almost all of the Internet 2 layer 3 traffic, um, the RNE and the TRCPS, now I2PX, was riding over AL2S at the time. So AL2S and AL3S nodes were totally separate. Um, all customers connected on AL2S nodes and had to be backhauled back to their AL3S node. Um, and uh, even AL3S nodes were then connected to each other through AL2S. So even you know um, just your standard BGP traffic ultimately was signaled via OpenFlow underneath. So you know I think at the time I took a look at the traffic um, and it was like two petabytes of traffic a day that we were handling and it was all OpenFlow signaled. So um, it was pretty cool. Um, there were some initial bumps uh, and you know so hardware and software, right? OESS had some problems scaling when we had five node NDDI network with 10 circuits on it. That was relatively small. And when you grow that in size and complexity, uh, you run into lots of bugs and scaling issues and all kinds of things. So, you know, we had lots of work to do to, to get OESS up to speed. Um, and we also found that we really had a lot of numerous vendor bugs uh, that we had to account for. Um, and this really led to an intensive testing regime of the entire stack. Um, every OESS re release required us to test against both Juniper and Brocade versions of what we were running in production. And then every Juniper and Brocade hardware or, or, um, revert version required us to also do all that same testing again. So we were, we were basically constantly testing. Um, and, and testing really started to take a longer and lo a larger role in the entire project. Um, so it got to the point where more than half of our developer time was just going into testing. I, and it wasn't just OESS testing. We had to test each vendor revision. We had to test each OESS, each flow space firewall revision, 
Uh, Tesla, we were trying to put uh, uh, external controllers. So um, open date with somebody wanted to run an open daylight controller and we were working on that. There was a genie controller. So every time we wanted to make one of these large changes or code upgrades on, on the system, we had to do a large amount of testing. And that testing really looked like a, about one full week of engineering time plus a burn-in test. Um, and we ended up writing scripts to help us make this possible, but it still ended up being a super human intense problem. So just a quick look at like open flow device testing. Um, so we started off just specifically looking at, does this work well for OESS? Um, basically, can we forward traffic? Hybrid mode. So the, the management side of these devices was never configured via open flow. So you've always got this problem of how do you bootstrap an open flow network? Well, we just went with this hybrid mode where some interfaces would just be could, and VLAN tags could be manually statically configured. And that would be how we would do our initial um, management plane. Um, a nonstop forwarding feature. This was actually one of the things that we wanted that was out of the open flow spec. Um, basically, if the controller disconnects, we want all the same flow rules to stay and continue forwarding as they were. Um, how many flow rules can we install? Do flow stats work? Well, that's what we really started off testing with. But eventually, we realized we needed some more info to, to really be able to characterize how the network would work. Things like, well, how fast can we install flow rules? Like, how fast can OESS send them? Um, how fast can we receive a port down message from the, uh, the switch? Like we send a, we put a port down, how long does it take for the switch to detect that send a port status message? And then what's the latency from the, that switch to the controller and how fast can the controller respond? Um, even, you know, how long does it take from when the switch receives a flow rule to when that flow rule is actually activated in hardware? Um, the responses for some of these questions were vastly different across different versions of, of vendor code. Um, and the other interesting thing as we kept testing, we kept finding really weird problems. Flow rules not ordered properly in hardware, probably the hardest one to figure out at the time, um, just because everything would be working great. You wouldn't make any change. And the device had some internal timer and it would just go through and reorder all the flow rules on you. And everything went from working to not working um, almost immediately. <laughs> and we had no idea what was going on. Um, we had problems where like hardware tables would run out of space. So um, it just kept going further and further in the hardware table. So you'd add remove flow rules. So I'd have four flow rules, but I ran out of um, table space really weird again. Constant flow removal, removal and addition could actually lock up the, the devices. So we had to like put even rate limits in so that way you couldn't send flow rules too quickly because potentially that would suck up all the CPU and the, the, the device would crash. Um, and we even had weird hardware failures like we put a port down and try and bring it back up and then and it just wouldn't come back up. We'd have to go and actually reboot the entire box to get it back. Um, and we even had open flow specification related problems. So there were multiple times where we'd have a call with the vendor engineers, say Cisco or Brocade or Juniper and discuss what the spec actually meant by some certain open flow um, command or rule. Um, I remember spending a lot of time talking with Cisco about pack it in and pack it out. And they thought that it was the weirdest thing that we wanted to do this. Um, but it was like, this is what the spec says guys. So, um, so yeah, we, we, had, we had a lot of device testing there. And that led to us generating um, reports. So I tried to, to do the best job I could to fit um, one of these reports in here. So you can kind of see that we, we go through and list a whole bunch of you know, the OESS specific features, if they function or not. Uh, we, we would look at things like how many flow rules can we insert at a time? What's the latency from when we send a flow rule to when it gets installed in the hardware? Um, port down, um, you know, response time, um, all kinds of different things, and some open flow specification, um, you know, standards as well. So we would look at all of this kind of information before, uh, when we were doing testing, generate a report and basically give a recommendation as to whether or not we could deploy this on the AL2S network at the time. So a lot of a lot of work went into these, probably two weeks worth of work to just go through and and. Um, do that testing and generate this report. So that then leads us to, so that was how we tested the hardware devices, but we still have to test the OESS software and the rest of the stack as well. 
Um, and so this really involved multiple layers of testing. So we had unit tests, which really just helped the developers, hey, did I like totally break something? It, like un unawarely, like, hey, I changed this one, this, one, um, this one function and I didn't realize that something else was using it and needed this specific behavior. Um, automated tests, so this was kind of like the first pass, you get some stuff configured in the test lab, you let it go and just see, hey, does the basic functionality of the system even work before we start putting human time into it? And then the human testing where we go through, we're literally clicking everything in the UI, testing out all of the admin features, um, doing all kinds of different discovery and, and um, you know, network modifications, verifying all of the different features of, of OESS were working. Once we got past that, we would enter burn-in testing, where we would run a bunch of different um, things, create teardown circuits. Basically, for if we let this run for five days, just constantly doing stuff, does everything survive? Um, and then stage testing, where we actually would simulate the entire upgrade, running the controller, and do it with what looked like the production network at the time. So obviously, there's a lot of testing involved here. Um, so just a quick idea here, unit tests, today we have 163 different test files, um, 1,300 different uh, unit tests. Mostly these are like database interactions, object models, module interactions, and, and individual functions that, you know, um, you know, hey, I want you to send an email. Does that email, does, does the email work? <laughs> Can I actually send an email? Can I pull out the user's email address um, from the system? All that kind of information is is listed, is tested before we even get to the point of a human testing it. Um, we also get test coverage reports. So, you know, we have kind of our minimum, here's the minimum code coverage for us to be, you know, considered a safe release. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing is nowadays we actually run these for every pull request. So before an engineer can move on from whatever tasks they're working on, we make sure that, you know, hey, all of the unit tests passed. Um, hopefully you also added unit tests and uh, nothing didn't, nothing broke accidentally. Automated testing, this still required us to do a little bit of work in our test lab. We have the glimmer glass devices and we kind of resurrected those. Um, and the glimmer glass devices really helped out with us automating. We could actually automate the setup of the test lab and do things like up and down ports automatically. So we could do all those kinds of things um, to really help us out getting the, the test lab set up, getting things working. Um, and we also have some test servers to send traffic. So we would actually provision or remove circuits. We'd perform some basic tests like send a 10 gig flow across, does iperf work? Can we ping? We'd, oh, we also had some other random traffic that we had generated um, to send across multiple VLANs, make sure everything passes through. So we were doing all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and the idea here was that hopefully this would let us know if we were in a good enough place where we could move on to doing human testing. And the human testing was basically we started generating a large spreadsheet of tests to be completed for every OESS release um, and, and vendor and flow space firewall and even external controller. Um, and these basically provided a topology, the, expecta the, the expected actions, the expected um, results, the intent of the test, um, if it was covered by an automated test, which, which automated test case actually covered it. Um, and each test is then marked passed or failed by the engineer running that test. It would take at least three days for a single engineer to complete this. Um, and it wasn't really something we could multitask on because there, there wasn't enough hardware in the test lab. So really you had one engineer that just had to plow through and do all this. Um, and it was testing everything from say a link migration. So I mentioned that, you know, we did discovery through open flow packet in packet out rules. Well, we had to, you know, so that's how you discovered a link. But if a port failed and you had to say move fiber from one port to another and have that link work, well, we needed to have all, you couldn't just copy and paste the config from that interface over to another one. You had to basically remove and add all new flow rules for that. So this, you know, we had to test like that kind of functionality. And if, you know, we can test that, hey, the function said it sent an email, but did that, did a person receive that email? Does the email look properly formatted? Does it have all the right information? That was stuff that we had humans that still needed to look at to verify. So this is just a, a, a few rows out of our testing spreadsheet. So, you know, give, it kind of gives you an idea of, of what we're dealing with here. It gives you, you know, the test file, um, you have the, the, the intended feature, if there's a dependency on something else, um, 
what the method is, what the expected result is, what part of the system that's really trying to test. Um, so we had all kinds of information like that that we've stored in this um, spreadsheet. Um, and then we get to um, burn-in testing. So this was a relatively long period. It had to be at least five days. Generally, we let it run for an entire week. So we'd start it, say, on a Friday, and then we would check on it the next Friday. Um, and basically, we just tried to simulate as many events as possible. Continual circuit provisioning, disconnecting, reconnecting nodes. Mostly, we're looking for memory leaks, crashes. You know, does our stuff, does the vendor stuff survive that? Um, so that was, that was what we were looking for with the burn-in tests. And then we finally get to stage testing, which I think, in my opinion, I thought was the coolest part where we actually could simulate the full AL2S network. Um, so we used Mininet, we, had, we modified it heavily, um, we put web services in front of it. And so we actually would take a snapshot of the OESS database from AL2S, and we would simulate the entire network via Mininet. And then we could actually, you know, basically start o the OESS controller and do things like ping across every circuit to verify it functioned properly. Then we could do an upgrade from the current version to whatever our new version was and verify that you know the flow rules did what we expected. Um, that And we could even interconnect physical devices into it. And that was something we did. So we could actually test the full AL2S topology, send actual traffic across physical devices and, and basically be able to simulate everything we needed to to verify functionality. Um, and because we ran this on um, a snapshot of the actual OASS DB, I had to apologize to several people um, quite a few times because it took us a while to figure out that we needed to sanitize our database. So some of you might remember early on getting emails, sorry, your circuits really did not go down. This was, this was us in the test lab verifying some functionality. So, um, you know, we, we, we learned a lot doing all that. Um, and the other part of that is that we would actually use this to generate and execute our method of procedure. So we actually would write out a full map for what we were going to do. And we use that also to look for any forwarding changes that might occur. So that way we could send the appropriate level of messaging with, um, when we were sending out our notifications. So the end results of all this testing, well, we generate a code coverage report. We do a burn-in testing report, we do a stage testing report, and a final MOP submission, basically to determine the release readiness. So, you know, every OESS release is at least you know two weeks worth of, of testing work plus several days of combining all these reports to get something ready to go. Um, and we did so we did this a lot, right? We did dozens of successful releases. Most went smooth, and and we continued to make progress. Um, uh, vendor software and hardware failures and limitations were, were really limiting our efforts though, right? So it was the lowest common denominator network because um, we could only do what all the devices could do. Um, so even if a brocade could do some really cool feature, if a Juniper didn't, we really couldn't take advantage of it. Uh, we had a really poor open flow of support from the vendors. They tried hard, um, or they mostly tried hard, um, but it just, I, they needed, I, I don't know what they needed, but we, we weren't getting what we needed. Um, and no one was really following the protocols um, as specifically as I think we had hoped originally. Um, OpenFlow 1.3 was promised and we really never even got to that point. We, we tried a few times, but we just could not get OpenFlow 1.3 support from the vendors. And the buggy, buggy implementation from the vendors caused all of this testing um, and Really, we didn't get that many updates from them. I think we probably did two or three Juniper upgrades and maybe four or five Brocade upgrades. And I probably tested at least 20 or 30 different versions of Brocade code, for example. So, you know, it was it was fairly hit or miss. Um, and, and this really led to us being unable to do things like we really wanted to do some um, open flow um, controllers like Open Daylight to, to try those out and try um, like SD WAN um, capabilities from Open Daylight. And we just, we tried, we tried really hard, but we just, we never really got the functionality from the devices. So this all leads to um, OESS 1.1.8 release and um, supercomputing 2015. So if anybody remembers, uh, just before supercomputing started, we tried to do an OESS upgrade and things didn't go well. So there's a little story behind it. 
Um, so OESS 118 changes were mostly bug fixes and a few were new features focused around our addition of NSI. And NSI was needed for some upcoming supercomputing demo. So we were kind of in a rush, but we did follow most of our standard testing procedure. We had better than 70% code coverage. We had um, our burn and test successful. Stage testing didn't show any issues. We kind of rushed through it, but you know, hey, everything looked good. All systems are go. But we didn't realize there's kind of a big problem under the hood. Um, so we kind of had a big problem. Um, there's a timeline. Essentially, what happens is the, the maintenance began. Our engineer goes and installs the new the new um, software code, and that causes one of the processes to restart. We didn't expect it to happen, and that kicks off our. Um, basically a restart of the system while he's in the middle of doing the maintenance. Um, we hadn't stopped OESS. We liked doing OESS upgrades while OESS was running. So that way there was as little downtime as possible. But when this kicked off restarting OESS, it basically said, I'm going to go diff the network. And it went to the database to pull all the circuits and didn't find any. Um, so essentially, this leads to a 10 minute period where OESS first pulls all of the OpenFlow rules off of the entire network. And then once it's restarted by the network engineer finishing the maintenance, it then goes and tries to push all of the new OpenFlow, it tries to re-push all those flows. So essentially we remove every OpenFlow flow from the network and then it goes and pushes all those open flows back on, all those OpenFlow rules back on. Um, so, so what really happened? Uh, installing a package, uh, up, uh, installing our package caused an unexpected behavior. We put a new Dbus configuration in place, and that caused it to basically restart itself. And then our recovery system, we had an automated thing called CoreSync and Pacemaker, which were supposed to basically help us fail over in case something like this happened. And it basically started OESS up again without any human input in the middle of the maintenance. And essentially, there was a small delay from run, for running the OESS schema upgrade. And OESS 118 had some new fields that were needed. And so when FWDCTL tried to query the database, it essentially got back a list of zero circuits and said, there's no circuits on the network. I'm going to remove all of the OpenFlow flows. So there's good news and bad news here. Well, we fixed the problem before we even knew there was a problem. Like the knock called and I was just getting turned up when the, everything was fixed. So, uh, you know, we basically it was fixed before anybody could do anything about it. The maximum affected time was 10 minutes. We were able to diagnose it in less than an hour, which, you know, if you compare that to how long it might take when you go to Juniper or Cisco, that was pretty good. Um, in fact, we're even able to reproduce it in the lab within 30 minutes of, of figuring out what happened. Obviously, there's a lot of bad things that happen too, right? We, we dedicate a lot of time to testing, didn't find it. One minute difference was enough to tear down the entire network. Automated system, which was supposed to help us, was, was really causing more problems. Uh, Corusync and Pacemaker were really kind of a pain before this, but they were, you know, it was the ultimate cause of this. And really, our software should have been smart enough to detect this case uh, and, and not do this. Good news is, hey, this is a quick fix. We can prevent this from happening again. Just detect if we put a schema version in, detect if we're not running the right version. And if we're not, just bail out. Um, additionally, we'll just stop OESS before we do a maintenance again, so that way we don't have this problem. And just be, in general, more careful looking at MOP and stage testing. So OESS, we, we left running, everything looked good besides that. Um, and a few days later, we find another bug. Um, basically, links weren't failing over. We had a, a relatively new engineer who was um, starting on the project. And there was a bug, and I didn't quite properly supervise and, and review the code enough to, to see this problem. And basically, what was happening is until a link went down and came back up, it wasn't listed as up in the network. And so we wouldn't do failovers. How do we miss it? Again, we were in a rush. And so we had skipped doing an actual 117 release and testing. We just tagged it and then went on. And so we didn't really review the change log ahead of time. Um, so we, we reviewed the 118 change log, but we didn't go back and review the 117 to say, hey, we made a change in here. We really should take a closer look. So we kind of missed that. And uh, we didn't have the right set of tests, so we added those. 
Um, really easy fix. Hey, it's just four lines of code. Um, we can do an emergency release. Uh, you know, essentially here we identified the problem at one. We have the code fixed and mostly tested by 7 p.m. We schedule maintenance for 4 a.m. It's four lines of code, relatively small. We know where it is. We're just going to do it. So we start testing the fix uh, at 8 p.m. You know, basically we hand it over to the systems team to do their testing, and they do it nine to two. Mop stage testing two to three, and then we do basically a, a big run through at 3 a.m. Remember, our maintenance is at four. And at 3.30, uh-oh, we see the same problem again where OESS removes all the flows and pushes them back on. Luckily, we didn't do it when on the production side, right? We caught this in our testing. So we're glad that we at least were paying a lot closer attention to our mop and stage testing, but we've never seen this behavior before and we don't have enough time, so we have to cancel our maintenance. We investigate and we figure out, hey, this bug has actually been here for a while. We've been running this code for six months, and every time we restart OESS, there's a one in five chance of this hitting. So we're kind of now at a time crunch. We have to figure out what's going on. So OK, we, we see what's going on. Really small thing, refactor to fix it. A little bit of a larger change than we want. Basically, what was happening is um, FWC CTL is the first thing to start, and then everything waits until FWC CTL is ready to go, and it generates its cache um, too early, and it was causing this problem. So again, relatively small change. We're not going to do the full release testing. So you know, here's the timeline again. 3.30, we figure out there's a problem, cancel a maintenance. 4.30, problems identified. 5, we go back to sleep because you know it's been a long day at this point. 10 a.m., we regroup, determine a fix. We've got a fix in place. 4 p.m., we're testing. 4.10, everything looks good to go. Or 4, 4 p.m., everything looks good to go. And then 4.10, everything just comes to a halt. Basically, we, we'd split up the work. We had people doing stage testing, people doing mop testing. And all of a sudden, all the systems just stopped working, like almost simultaneously. They're all independent of each other. They're just running the same version of code, and all of them stop working. Even our stage environment it stops working, and we have no idea what's going on. We were, we were really frustrated by this point in time. We've had a really rough week. <laughs> we haven't slept in a long time. It was rough. Um, yeah, we spent a long time looking at this. Um, we were very frustrated. Um, you know, we have to thank the managers because they could tell that we were, you know, we were trying hard, but we were really at a loss. Um, so, you know, they provided pizza. So that at least was a, a bright side there. And finally, we, we figured it out. We had changed one configuration in the Dbus config, which blew this up. Um, essentially, we were pushing things on the Dbus and not pulling them off. And we were getting the messages, but nothing was actually removing them from the Dbus queue. Um, and so eventually the Dbus, the entire Dbus system would fill up and that would actually cause other processes that were using Dbus to crash as well. So it wasn't just OESS, like the entire system could hang or crash and we had, we, it was really tough to figure out. Um, luckily it was a two line fix and we figured it out at uh, 1045 PM that day. So um, yeah, it was really rough, but we had a successful 118A release. Um, and we had a lot of lessons learned, right? We improved testing. Dbus was just too much of an unknown and we needed to remove it. The entire system felt too complicated, especially with poor sync and pacemaker. And we also learned that the engineers can function with three hours of sleep. Um, but I think this was kind of the straw that broke um, the, the back on OpenFlow. Um, and this is where the discussions start leading us to moving to NPLS. So the first change we made here was taking um, open uh, taking Dbus out of the mix. So the diagram looks the same, except for that we've switched everything to using RabbitMQ um, or the AMQP protocol instead of Dbus for all of our message passing, which truthfully is way simpler than the Dbus signatures were. Um, Dbus signatures were very difficult for us to keep um, to keep accurate whenever we were making changes. So RabbitMQ actually made life a lot simpler. Um, and like I said, you know, we've done like 30 releases from 2013 to 2016, and most of them went smooth. There were maybe a few bugs, but we didn't have any major things until that 2015 outage. Um, 
the network was the lowest common denominator and it, but of OpenFlow support. And because of that, we couldn't really do much more than OESS. And then when this OESS 118 bug hit, that was kind of the end of it. So that was the start of what we called the 2016 project, where we removed the brocades and OpenFlow from the AL2S network. Um, so OESS 120 um, with MPLS support um, was released in July of 2017, and the, the migration from OpenFlow to MPLS was the end of July 2017. So how did we change the architecture to make this work? Um, essentially, we just added in um, some processes that talk direct NetConf to the devices. So we have MPLS, FWD, CTL, and MPLS Discovery. Both of them have active NetConf, like long-running NetConf connections to the devices. Um, but we still have the OpenFlow side because we needed to basically run both simultaneously. That was part of our migration strategy. Um, so essentially, we extended the database schema so that way we could distinguish between which open which VLAN tags on each port were controlled by OpenFlow and which were controlled by VLANs or by by MPLS. Um, and then we basically um, could provision either MPLS or OpenFlow based on what those VLAN tags were configured for. You just couldn't mix them. So you couldn't do an MPLS to OpenFlow circuit. Um, and then we had an automated script, which would basically migrate each circuit individually. So it would gather the OpenFlow circuit details, move the OpenFlow circuit, update the VLAN tags to be MPLS, and then reprovision that circuit. So this was kind of a slow process. The OpenFlow removal is really fast, but the Juniper commit time is kind of slow when you're doing, it was like three or 4,000 active circuits at the time. And so that was, it was really slow to kind of go one at a time because every time you had to do a commit on the Juniper and the more L2 circuits we added to each of those Junipers, the longer it actually took um, because the CPU would slow down as it was doing all the MPLS convergence. Um, uh, 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 the, the process estimate was about five, eight hour periods to complete. So we actually did this in one week. Um, essentially the engineers worked a night shift. Um, so we'd start at midnight Eastern and we'd go until 8 a.m. So as people were coming into the office, we were just finishing up and heading out. Um, so there was a lot of work involved with that. Um, and so that leads us to OESS development now. So um, there's a significant reduction in testing. Um, MPLS is well-known utilized technology. Um, so this meant that you know the, all of that device testing we were doing kind of got thrown out the window now. Um, the network engineers can do their testing, verify that the devices meet their standard. Um, and we just, we mostly rely on that. We have a very simple lab topology now, um, and we just verify the, the functionality of those MPLS configurations from OESS, make sure that we can, you know, we still have some devices in the test lab that can generate traffic and we basically push traffic across there, verify all the functionality. Um, but, you know, like removing OpenFlow removed a ton of tests. We don't have to test failover or link migration or any of those things because that's all handled via, you know, some more standard native protocols. And this means that there's more time for feature development. So um, one of the things here, too, I just thought would be interesting for people who are interested. We, we actually kind of break out um, responsibilities for OESS. So the network engineers ultimately control the templates that we use for L2 and L3 VPNs. Um, so we, we, we generated some initial templates, like we basically had network engineers create their ideal L2 VPN and L3 VPN. And then we take those we, and we turn them into templates and then changes basically go through the network engineers and we can apply them um, outside of an OESS release, but we really do like to tie it to the OESS release. Um, OESS does a diff to verify the configuration on the device matches um, what OESS thinks it should be. And if it doesn't have that, it'll actually create alarms for our network engineers to go and uh, resolve when there's um, when there's a sync problem. Um, and a, another interesting part here is we've kind of done some device and protocol level abstractions. So um, you know we can support multiple devices, multiple vendors, um, multiple uh, circuit types, for example. Um, so we do L2 VPN, L2 VPLS, L2 CCC, L3 VPN, and the latest is eVPN, which we're using on the QFX devices for Manlan and Wix. Um, and that leads us to OESS 2.0.0, which was released in October of 2018. So um, this, will, this is where we've now kind of rebranded it to Cloud Connect. Um, and uh, it does, it's got a new web UI. It's got a brand new API. Um, it 
also was what included L3 VPN support. Um, and we also included our first cloud integration with AWS. Um, obviously, since then, we've added in Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud Platform um, integrations as well. So um, I know lots of people have, have been deployed and uh, used those services. Um, and we also have this new entity concept for provisioning. Instead of selecting an individual port, you select who you want to provision to. Um, so the new web UI and APIs, basically the 2.0 version gave us a chance to clean up a lot of our code and APIs and use some newer web frameworks. So for example, we were using YUI, um, Yahoo um, user interface. Um, and that I think went uh, deprecated in 2014 or 2015. And uh, we had been maintaining it um, because obviously we needed to for OESS. So this was a good chance to, to do that. But, so the new web UI uses Bootstrap. Um, the, the APIs that we originally written were, were done fairly hastily and we had kept modifying and improving, but um, really the 2.0 gave us a chance to kind of start over and, and rethink about how we wanted to, to do our internal, um, internal library structure and APIs. Um, and, and that also led to basically the, uh, a hopeful, what is hopefully a better set of APIs in, um, for, for users to programmatically access as well. Um, the back end is still written in Perl, um, but we improved all of our object, object extraction and database interactions, and we created an, an kind of an interface for um, working with new device types. So some of the major changes from 1.0 to 2.0. So there's this entity versus interface selection. And, and one of the problems that we faced was there was a complexity that you had to understand the network, like where people were on the network in order to provision to them. And this kind of actually was limiting for people wanting to do it yourself provision. We ended up with lots of questions of, I want to provision to here, how, where do I, how do I do that? And it's really the problem they were facing was, I just don't know where so-and-so actually connects to the network. Um, so entities is our, is our concept here. And this gives us the ability to specify who instead of where. So you can say, I want to connect to Indiana University. And it'll say, oh, well, there's two ports for Indiana University. Which one do you want to use? Instead of knowing that Indiana University connects in Atlanta and Indianapolis. Um, so, so that's kind of the difference. Um, there's no more path selection. Um, one of the things that was determined was that the Internet 2 engineers needed the ability to do better traffic engineering and traffic control. And if you got to specify your own port, your own paths, that would be fairly difficult for them to do. Um, the other thing, um, so with OpenFlow, you had either a primary path or a primary and a backup path. And if, let's say, you didn't have a backup path, we would automatically figure one out for you. But if that path went down and your primary path was down, you were out of luck. Um, and then if uh, you had a primary and a backup and both of those were down, um, you also got stuck with um, your circuit would not, would not forward traffic. So now with MPLS, as long as a path exists between your endpoints, you will have your traffic make it through. So that was another change. So that leads me to some OESS coming soon features. So we're deprecating OESS 1.0 web UI and API. So um, I think this will probably be in uh, late March, early April. Um, so if you're using the old web UI, you might try out the new web UI. Everybody has access to it. And um, if, you're, if you're an API user, please, uh, and you're using the 1.0 API, please contact me. Um, I, we, we've done a one pass already at looking at people using the 1.0 API. And so hopefully everybody's been contacted and knows. Um, one of the things we work, we've been working on and we are very close to having done is OESS with NSO support. So the NGI network will continue to use OESS, um, but it's also gonna be automated using NSO. So OESS has now got an NSO driver. And so we have the ability to now provision services in NSO through OESS. And so that's how OESS is going to work in the new NGI. Um, and hopefully you'll see continued UI enhancements. We wanna make the web UI better for everybody. So if you have complaints, please let us know. We'll, we'll definitely take those into consideration as we do more and more work. Um, integration with Grouper, um, we're very close to releasing this now. Um, I just got a demo of it from Jonathan, who's kind of the lead on OESS at this point. Um, and uh, basically, this is going to give you the ability to manage your own work groups and permissions. In, and 
it's also going to uh, integrate better with the Internet 2 tool suite. So um, if you've heard of co-manage or you've heard of the Internet 2 collaboration platform, um, this is going to integrate with that. And so hopefully you'll have kind of one set of credentials now that you'll be able to use to access all of those different types of tools. I believe this will also include some of the other NSO features that they're doing. So um, this will be this will be um, super useful for, I think, end users. And there's going to be some more configuration stuff in L3 VPNs coming. So for example, prefix lists, prefix limits, um, being able to set the ASN um, inside of the your L3 VPN inside of the Internet 2 network. So we're working on all that stuff right now. So that is really all that I've got. Um, I know it was a lot of stuff and I went quick. So anybody have any questions or comments? Well, first, thank you, AJ. Really, really great overview and certainly a trip down memory lane for those of us <laughs> who did sign ed in, in 2015 and can remember uh, all of the GRNOC engineers basically being sleep deprived for those couple of days. Uh, so we had a couple of questions come in, and certainly uh, others type them in as we're, we're going through this. Uh, so the first one was about vendor support. Has this improved today uh, versus the past? And I, I believe the answer is yes, but if you want to talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I mean, we're not doing OpenFlow anymore, so I, I, I do a lot less interaction with the vendors. But yeah, I think, I think in general, more more of the classic uh, stuff is much better supported and and they're much more responsive to the open flow stuff must have been you know like some dedicated like two or three people over at each of those companies working on it because it was it, it was just I think it was maybe too much for them at the time so yeah I think I think the vendor support has gotten um, better with the more classic protocols okay and the second is about uh, the upcoming change to the 2.0 API. Is the 2.0, uh, 2.00 API backward compatible with 1.x API for topology info and I2 services? No. Uh, how about the API off mechanism? The API off mechanism. I don't know what that means. Oh, the right, off, you made... off mechanism. Okay. Um, the, the, so yes, the off mechanism is the same. Um, there's actually a new one now. So. We just still provide a basic auth because a lot of people have trouble trying to figure out how to navigate shibboleth authentication. So um, the basic, and so, so essentially we're using, we, we have, um, it's essentially basic auth to you. It's Kerberos on our backend. Um, so um, auth is the same. You can also do the shibboleth based um, ECP um, authentication now, if you can do that. Um, the API is not backwards compatible. So the 2.0 API is different. Um, there are different CGIs, there are different uh, methods for making calls to them. For example, the whole entity concept is new. Um, if you do need to change your application to work with the new API, um, we have API docs available. And, uh, you know, as always, we can help consult to figure out what kind of, like, how to map your changes to the new API. I know a couple of people that probably will need pointers to that. So when you send me your slides, send me the link to that. I'll make sure that goes out in the email. Yep. If you're actually at the OESS page, there's a documentation link at the bottom and all of the documentation is linked there, including YouTube videos, the API docs, all of it. Perfect. I'll make sure to send a link. All right. Uh, next question. In version two, is there a way to choose the path manually? No. Path selection is no longer available. And the next one, does OESS 2.00 enforce bandwidth on MPLS circuits? Um, it enforces bandwidth at cloud providers because we have to, but other than that, it does not enforce any bandwidth constraints. Okay. All right, we'll pause for another minute here to see if any additional questions come in. I have just uh, a couple here that I had jotted down. I, you know, over the years here, I, I know this has supported a number of demos and production use cases and anything. Is there any one that sticks in your mind as a particularly interesting use case? Not because it, it either worked well or worked poorly, but just, you know, so, something that maybe you guys didn't think of that somebody was implementing on top of it? Um, well, I mean, I think, uh, I think probably the most interesting one is um, I think the, University of Virginia guys are doing, and they're, it's, this is the XSEED. Uh, I, I think it's XSEED. 
Uh, it's it's radar data. They're they're trying to stream the radar data using layer two multi, um, using the layer two network. So basically, as sites come and go, they'll automatically update their circuits uh, to add and remove endpoints. So that way, you're only sending traffic to the sites that actually want it instead of sending it out everywhere. So I think that's probably one of the more interesting ones. Okay. Uh, another question. One of the problems with OpenFlow 1.0 was the lack of multi-point VLANs. Are these now available with OESS and VLANs? So actually, we always, we, we, in the initial releases, we didn't have multi-point. But um, you know, within a year of, of it, we did have OpenFlow um, enabled multi-points. There was, there was two gotchas to it. Either you had full broadcast, it, it was not Mac learning. So either you had full broadcast or you had to specify the Mac addresses where they went. Um, so OpenFlow, the OpenFlow 1.0 did have that capability in OESS. Um, and today, yes, you can totally do multi-point layer two um, VPNs and it does do all the Mac learning stuff for you. Okay. Pause slightly in case anybody has any last questions they want to ask. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, we'll make sure that we get this video and the slides posted. Uh, and the talk for next week is going to be uh, Jorge Crescendo from the University of South Carolina talking about uh, virtual labs. Anybody doesn't have any other questions? I think that we are at the end for today. So thanks again. Oh, there we go. There's, there's always one person. In this case, it's Bill. Uh, speaking of broadcast, is there any idea of uh, bum filtering, or is it available? I don't know what bum filtering is. <laughs> broadcast, unicast, multicast. I. You, you'll have to talk to the, um, the the network engineers. I don't believe so. Okay, well, we'll take that one offline then. Uh, so thanks again, AJ, for, for giving this talk. And hope everybody has a good weekend. We'll talk to everybody soon.